It's that time again, everybody. An episode is a brewing. I can hear it in the air. Welcome to the Morya Noko. It's like dancing with the stars of Noko, except no dancing. We're just talking. Our guest for episode 30 is Jody Hartman, the executive director for the Greeley Transitional House. Recording this podcast with me is one of the last things Jody will do before her retirement from the Transitional House next month. So I was very, very grateful for her time and for her willingness to be on the show. Jody has served our community for a very long time, and the GTH is an organization I hope you enjoy learning more about because I certainly did. Without further ado, let's get to the episode. Hello and welcome listeners out there. I sit here on the campus of UNC in McKee Hall in my own graduate student office with Jody Hartman, the Executive Director of the Greeley Transitional House. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And let's just get started for any listeners out there who may not know, what is the Greeley Transitional House? Okay, so the Greeley Transitional House is primarily an emergency shelter program for homeless families. Um, So the most important distinction um, one should know about us is the fact that we do serve exclusively homeless families. Um, Emergency shelter is our primary program, but we do a lot more than that for families. So So one of the things that makes you all unique is that you do accept families, and this is uh, this is unique in in not only Greeley but the state as well. Maybe it it really sort of is. So normally, what happens is you will have usually single adult populations that are served by shelters with maybe a few family rooms added to the program. Obviously, I think we most most of us know the fact that there's pretty large chronically homeless adult population out there. So a lot of shelter work is around that population and and not as much around families. So what is unique is the fact that we do have a fairly large facility there. We have the capacity to have 12 families live with us at one time. And there's really no other family shelter of that size in northern Colorado. And I'm pretty sure there's nothing quite that large in terms of just purely emergency shelter down in the metro area. But there's definitely lots Lots and lots of services out there for homelessness, but for a program and a facility to be this focused with these many services for a homeless population that's exclusively families, I think we're very unique. And how did the transitional house start? Back in the mid-80s, around 1985, there were there was starting to be an emergence of homelessness being kind of grabbing the national attention. So not, there's always been homelessness. Um, But it was rising to the level during those years where people were a lot more conscious. There's more homeless on the streets. We're seeing more homeless families across the country. And it was about that time that um, the federal government under the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD as we all know, um, they started applying a lot more funding towards solving that problem. So that was one part of the equation. There was suddenly more funding out there for homelessness and even particularly family populations. And then secondly, there was just more homelessness. And so Mm -hmm. we could have a whole different discussion on another day about why homelessness started to grow back in the 70s and 80s. I think today is a perfect day for that. (laughs) Well, honestly, I think it's just a continuation of generational poverty. You know, we the war on poverty started in the 60s. Um, but again, there's always been poverty. But there's been a lot more policies on the federal level that have created poverty and, and created generational poverty that is continuing even to this day, but really started to grow, I think, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So by the 1980s, there were a lot more homeless families out there. So what was happening in Greeley at that time, the only shelter we had for anyone who was homeless was a small little migrant farm worker, predominantly shelter run by Catholic Charities of Northern Colorado. So it was called the Guadalupe Shelter. Uh, There is still a Guadalupe Shelter today, and we can talk in a bit about what they do. But um, at the time, there was just a small little shelter predominantly serving migrant farm workers. So here we have this phenomenon in the community where we're starting to see more homeless families. What do we do with families? They're obviously not appropriate to be housed with single adults, and so we have to figure out what to do. 
So what happened is United Way of Well County, the faith community, um, and at the time, Salvation Army was kind of a big player in the non the charitable realm. Um, so they were very, those three entities were pretty instrumental in developing the, the transi- transitional house. So we started out just a couple of extra bedrooms in a house owned by the Salvation Army. So able to help a couple families then. Um, we moved at one point and three or four years down the road to a, a big Victorian house with six bedrooms and one bathroom and one kitchen serving all these families. Um, Stayed there for about 14 years, and then in mid-2000s, 2005, we bought a building that we're at currently. It's at 1206 10th Street. And so this is the facility where we're able to house up to 12 families at a time. Um, So just, again, just a kind of a series of growths that we went through, increasing our capacity, and lots of community support for this. Um, I think that's probably, again, unique to Greeley and because you you don't see a program like this in Fort Collins or Loveland or Boulder. There, there just simply isn't a large family shelter. There's definitely some services there for them. Um, in many communities, the way that family homelessness is handled is through um, the Interfaith Hospitality Network, which basically it means churches take on sheltering families for a week, like a week at a time. They provide food. They they place them in, in their classrooms or whatever that they have available. So families move like from church to church and receive services. So that's how it's handled in a lot of communities, especially smaller communities. The faith community steps in. So Greeley, I think, is just super fortunate and unique in that we have this kind of support. Do you have any theory as to why this support ro- rose from Greeley? Well, I this, see this community yeah, vibe? Or? It, it is. It's just, that's a great way to put it. I've seen a great community vibe here. I will give a lot of kudos and credit to the United Way program we have here. Under the leadership of Janine Truswell, who's been there for a very long time, I think more than 30 years, they are just always leaders and at the forefront of seeing a community need, figuring out what needs to be done to address that need, and then supporting it. Um, so they really provided that that initial leadership I think we needed to start. And, of course, have been a funding partner ever since. I just watch this community over and over, see a need, see a problem, and then just really jump in in kind of an all-hands-on-deck type of attitude. It's not, well, it's you know, their responsibility because it's in Greeley. Because, by the way, we do serve all of northern Colorado. So we do see families from Larimer County and the metro area and other parts of Weld County. But, you know, it's just we various different funders came through. and So we had someone stop by the office. I'm not really sure where we were. But one question I did have for you was how often do you see people come up from the metro and, and work with you all as a transitional center? I wouldn't say a lot. I would say maybe. So first of all, I should clarify, we serve or actually shelter about 75 families a year. But we have something like probably 200 applications for housing every year. I shouldn't call it housing shelter. And the reason there's so many that don't come into the shelter is because something works out. We're always full. And so they can't wait you know they'll figure something else out well if I can't go into a shelter maybe I'll call my cousin and they'll let me stay with them for a while or my friend or uh, I finally got a job so I can afford rent now whatever the case may be uh, more than half the people who apply to our program never actually come to the shelter Mm. so back to your question how many are from the metro area really I would say no more than two to five percent so there's a lot of resources in the metro area Um, The only reason someone might come to Greeley would be because of work, usually. You know, they've heard of a work opportunity or even have been hired, but yet they didn't have the resources to actually live here yet. So we'll often see people, you know, arrive and say, oh, I'm... I'm here for a job, but I don't have any money, or I came here for a job and it didn't work out, and now I'm stranded. We see that a lot. That's usually why someone is coming to our shelter from out of Greeley. I wanted to come back to this piece of shelter versus housing. Could you explain that for listeners, why you corrected yourself on that? Right, because there's a real distinction. Shelter is temporary. The the funding we receive from the federal government is intended for 30-day stays, so there's not much money out there for emergency shelter. So what we're trying to do is get them 
in and out of our shelter as quickly as possible. If you were to visit our shelter, you would understand, but it's a really home-like environment, very cozy place. It's tempting for people to stay there, but most shelters, emergency shelters, are really very stark. They're usually a dormitory environment. You know, you've seen images on TV or in the movies about people on cots or on mats on the floor. Well, that's pretty much a reality, and you certainly don't want children in that environment very long. Again, the thought is we need to get them into housing as quickly as possible. We do housing programs as well. But the shelter itself is really for those acute emergency situations. They have nowhere else to go. They're going to be staying in their car. They're going to be in a motel. They might be, we've had people in tents in people's backyard. They might be staying in a very precarious, negative situation, say drugs or abuse happening in the home. So we need to get those people out of those situations quickly and into emergency shelter. You stay for ideally 30 days, but we'll talk about this a little bit more too. It usually takes 60 to 90 days to get them out of the shelter and into housing. Is that just because of getting hired and the process of getting signed up for an apartment? Yeah, all of that. When's the apartment open? Right. All three. So usually if they're not working when they arrive, that's the first priority because you have to have income in order to afford housing. Or if they're in a pretty poorly paying job, we'll work with them to try to get them better employment. Simultaneously, we don't wait until you have a job to start looking for housing. We start looking for housing immediately Mm -hmm. because there are long waiting lists for almost every government subsidized property. So if, if it's a family that is just really struggling, doesn't have enough income to afford our high rents, Um, They definitely are going to need subsidized housing, so we get them on those waiting lists right away. We do personal, the the agency has some funding to help with rent assistance, so we can help temporarily for three to six months, give them help with security deposits, get them kind of that initial push into housing, and then they're on their own after that. But yeah, so it's really important to understand that shelter is temporary. That's kind of a shift that this entire industry is making now. Um, When I first came to GTH, it was kind of like, let's try to work with them as long as we possibly can. We'll develop relationships, which sounds theoretically really great, and it is great. But what it tends to do is it slows down their progress when you kind of plant this seed in their mind from day one. Okay, well, you've got two years here for us to figure this out. It's kind of like human nature. You just take two years if you're told you have two years. You know, Mm -hmm. there's not the urgency. And and then even in some cases, they go backwards. It's a de-incentive to be told you have too much time. The philosophy or the, um, the... term now that's used pretty predominantly is called housing first. It's just exactly what it says. Try to get them into housing first before you work on anything else. Don't worry about making them housing ready by giving them a ton of life skill classes and uh, giving them all these resources that make them ideal housing candidates. Get them sober, get all their mental health issues straightened out, make them good parents, get them budgeting, get them writing great resumes. You know, all those things sound really great, Mm -hmm. but the reality is you don't have to have any of that to be housed. And there's plenty of people out there who are housed without those skills. Um, So the, the smart thing to do is get people into housing, and then you provide them services. Certainly there's tons of help out there for things like parenting or budgeting and those kinds of issues, but it's going to be a lot more effective and cost effective if that can be done while they're living in their own housing. And you all provide follow-up services, so does it include a lot of what you just mentioned? Exactly, yeah. So we hire case managers that are working with the families both inside the shelter to access resources, but then also after they leave the shelter We have a variety of programs that can help. Um, We actually do manage some apartments of our own. We don't own them, but the city of Greeley owns them for our exclusive use. Um, So again, it's intended for families coming out of emergency shelter, helping them with basically bridge housing. So just a temporary situation for a couple of years to help them figure out their next step in their housing plan and then move them into permanent housing. The goal with everyone, no matter where you start on the spectrum of housing, is permanent housing. So uh, we don't want anyone bouncing from 
shelter to shelter or temporary housing to temporary housing. You know, the longer term you can be in in housing, especially for children, the the more stable and better the whole household is. I think I want to play a bit of the audio clip from the video that's on your all's website because yeah, it was a great video, and I felt like... Um, I want to put it on the show's Facebook account because I just feel like there are pieces of that video that you can't you can't like explain right. with words. Yeah. And and you know the types of families and and just the the life experiences that people are bringing in. Yeah. Are you talking about helped. the mo- the blonde mom with yeah, the two boys? Yeah. Just kind of overview. That was a great one and so was the dad that we had on there. Yeah. So that's probably one thing too I should mention is that um we define family very broadly. So we see a lot of single moms, that's our biggest population, but we do see two parent families and a fair number of single dads. That happens quite often. We've we see grandparents raising grandchildren. We've had adult adults with adult children there. We've even had pregnant women who have no other children. Just as long as it's a family unit of some kind. We do serve same-sex couples. We have the one restriction we do have is that at least one adult in the family has to be at least 18 years old. Mm. So the whole homeless youth population, that is really an entirely different discussion, one of our more difficult populations to work with. Is it because of legalities? Yeah, yeah. predominantly. You know, if if they're a minor, if they're under the age of 18, legally they should be in the foster care system. And of course, most teens who are in that situation are not open at all to being in a foster care environment. So they do have a tendency to be really living under the radar and in very vulnerable places. And what makes it so difficult is that providing emergency shelter for that population is very hard because of the legal issues. Um, They do emergency shelter. I think there is one in Denver. The name is escaping me at the moment. But And there's other programs out there that provide kind of wraparound services, but the ability to actually house them is really the tricky part. And there's ways to get around that, but that's one thing we haven't been able to do here in Greeley. Do you feel like the rising popularity of people moving to northern Colorado Mm -hmm. and driving up housing costs in the last, let's just say, decade? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it really started before that, but uh, do you think that has affected the families that you all are seeing now? Absolutely. So there was two things that happened. I've been with GTH since 2005. So when I first came, say the first four or five years, The real issue was employment. So we kind of had a higher unemployment rate then and it seemed like uh, we saw families struggling more to just find employment, but housing wasn't nearly as difficult. But when the um, 2008-2009 recession hit, what happened there was obviously it impacted all of housing. So the construction of housing pretty much came to a halt. There was a a lot of foreclosures, which created homelessness. There was just kind of a big mess. But then right about that same time, simultaneously, was this big oil boom in northern Colorado. So for, and it might sound like that's kind of a dichotomy, but it isn't because what ended up happening is these oil field workers then came flooding into northern Colorado, took up all of the available housing that was out there. Because we underbuilt for a few years because of the recession, um, we just suddenly had this real scarcity of housing. So obviously that drives prices up. And we're getting slowly back to a more normal uh, place with our housing, but it's really been slow, and, it, and we haven't really seen a lot of improvement in rental prices or anything like that. And I don't know enough about economics to know if it will ever go back to a, an affordable level. Um, it really does seem like these days that <clears throat> Greeley and Weld can well, all of Colorado really, is becoming like the next California. You know, you hear so much about how horrible the prices are. <laughs> or even up in the Seattle area, I've been mm-hmm. hearing some terrible stories about that housing. That's really what's happened in Colorado. And I think some of it is just, again, the oil boom, the recession impacted everything, and just the quality of life in Colorado is so great. So many people want to live here. How that impacts us is, like everything else in society and in the economy, anything that impacts that middle class population, I would say doubly or triply impacts people living in poverty. You know, if say you or I are struggling to find housing, imagine 
if you're only earning $1,500 a month and all the two or three bedroom apartments in the community are at eleven and twelve hundred dollars a month just makes everything that much harder so and there isn't enough public funding out there to build enough subsidized housing to house all these people so they just really have to these people have to be survivors they have to figure out housing situations that aren't always ideal they have to uh, spend way more on their housing than they should be you know you hear that People should only be paying 30% of their income for housing. Well, that's really wonderful and a great theory, but I can pretty much guarantee you about 80% of the people we work with are spending 75% of their income on housing between their rent and their utilities and uh, any costs associated with housing. So what does that do? It makes them very precarious. All it takes is for them to be have an illness or a child care problem or a transportation problem and they lose their job and the next thing you know they're homeless again. So it's it's kind of a never ending battle really. But I enjoyed on your website you have a tab that is under the title Understanding Homelessness. And I enjoyed it because I feel like I don't know if Stigma is too strong of a mm-hmm. word, but I feel like there's there's some predisposed opinions people have about what is homelessness, what does it look like, right. and how do people become homeless. Right. And I think people don't stop and think that if I'm struggling to get by, I miss one shift, or I called in late too many times, or for some reason I lost that job, and I, it's, I couldn't pick one up in the next week, I'm out. Right. It's over, and right. I'm homeless now. And it's not like it was five years of getting my paycheck and running to the casino and gambling it away. I mean, that's that's what some people probably think ends up causing people to be homeless. And so I think there's power in hearing people's stories and just seeing that example that if I'm on the edge of some, like, financial cliff, it takes one misstep, especially if you have two, three kids, Mm -hmm. and you find yourself in need. Right. These aren't people with what you would perceive as being like real personality disorders or something. Obviously, there's mental illness and and poor decision-making in every class in our society. It has nothing to do with poverty or being low income, but people do not fall into homelessness completely by their own bad choices. It's systemic. We have... Uh, we don't have enough resources to make housing available for everyone at an affordable cost. So like you say, all it takes is, you know, if you don't have enough income and you you fall into, you lose that income temporarily, you haven't had the ability to save, and the next thing you know, it you fall into uh, homelessness. I think why we don't see more homelessness, honestly, is because a big portion of the this struggling low-income population has family support that can help them. So like if my kids were to suddenly lose their jobs, they would have a safety net with me because I would have the ability to have them live with me for a while. So many of the families that we're working with, they don't have that. They are coming from, like I said earlier, generational poverty. They were raised in households that were probably living on um, very little as well. And so they may be in subsidized housing where it's actually a major lease violation if you have someone else live with you. If I'm receiving any kind of a subsidy for my housing, I absolutely cannot have any other adult living with me that is not on the lease and is not being considered for income. So uh, they just don't have that safety net. So that's another big part of it is that we've been looking at poverty for too long or we haven't solved poverty for uh, too long. And so that we're now seeing generation after generation that can't pull themselves up because they don't have that family support system. I was going to say that wealth distribution and having people Mm -hmm. on the low end is almost inevitable. And Mm -hmm. that's like, that's a hard thing that I Mm -hmm. wrestle with sometimes. Right, right. It's a reality. I understand. And that that I want to limit that, but I don't even, you know, uh, I'm no economist. I know. (laughs) I know. Or nor are we um, those political strategists that would know how to solve this from a systemic point. Um, I just do know that our poverty population is growing and we're not doing enough to address that. We address a lot of the symptoms of poverty, but 
we as a society are, have not yet really reached a point of solving what's causing poverty. Yeah, we got to water the roots you mm-hmm. know, instead of trimming the branches. Mm-hmm. We've got to we got to find and this is not. I'm not saying I know the solution. I don't either. I'm not saying I'm advocating that it's easy. <laughs> right. But, um, right. I think there are steps out there, and you know, yeah. And, and I feel like you all are helping this portion of the community, right. and um, when. Uh, Leslie Bicknell, a previous guest on the show, told me about you all. I knew I had to have you all on. You all feature some stories of people who've stayed at the, at the transitional house on your website. Did mm-hmm. you just ask people, hey, would you be willing to put your name and face mm-hmm. out there yeah. and, and give a testimony? Yeah. So every family that comes through has the opportunity to fill out kind of an evaluation of what they learned from the program and how it helped them. Um, and they're free to make comments, good and bad. I've just been amazed how overwhelmingly positive the comments always are. You know, I would say the most negative thing that happens is they make no comments at all. (laughs) So we'll say to ourselves, really? You didn't have anything to say about your stay here? You know, that that's about as negative as it gets. That's better than YouTube can say for sure. (laughs) Exactly. So, but the people who comment, I mean, it's just, those are the stories you saw on our website is just people saying how much it had helped them and things they had learned and there's a lot there's always kind of a variety but the the theme is always I came to the shelter feeling like nobody really cared or knew what to do to help me Um, your staff were just so amazing and caring and really guided me in in resources and then I feel a lot more confident now to go out and and be on my own and really make my household and family work Mm. That's really kind of the theme over and over. Yeah. And I want to break down some numbers for listeners at home. So the federal minimum wage, correct me if I'm wrong, is about $8. Actually, it's gone up. It Believe it or not, up. it's at 1020 right now. Whoa. And Whoa. Colorado has kind of a graduated scale. It's going to go up again in January. Um, it goes up maybe 40 or 50 cents every year for five or six years. So we are a little higher. Okay, that. so about 10, mm-hmm. you would say. Mm-hmm. Okay, so at $10 an hour, if a person works 40 hours a week, they're fully employed, that's going to be about $20,000 a year. Mm-hmm. So we're looking post-tax, we're looking at probably less than $1,500 mm-hmm. a month. Right. So I just want people out there to think. There are many people in the community who make this, and they're not working part-time. They're not unemployed. They are 40 hours a week working full-time, and they're making $1,500 a month, bringing home. That spread's pretty thin. Mm -hmm. And some of the people out there are probably thinking, wow, $1,500 a month for everything in my life. That's hard for me. Mm -hmm. Imagine having a child or Mm -hmm. two. And I think it's easy for listeners to quickly see how families end up contacting you all. I mean, that's like, when you you just look at the math on paper and you think about your own budget, it's... um, it becomes well, obvious. It actually makes you wonder why aren't there more homeless families? You know? That was my first thought. Yeah. yeah, it's just. I think one important distinction with the minimum wage is it's. I don't believe it's ever been intended to be a living wage. I, I think that would be kind of a fascinating subject to research, but there's really no comparison between what is a minimum wage and what is a living wage. So, living wage for a family of four. Well County probably is more in the $22 an hour range. What really all that means is that would be what it would take for a family of four to be able to afford all their basics without any kind of government assistance. You know, the government can choose to either you know, pay all these subsidies, these very expensive programs that don't always work, or they could help us boost that minimum wage even higher and I don't know how you do that I'm not an economist right. but you know it's just it's kind of a weird weird phenomenon that we've we're at that point in our society and I do understand how badly minimum wage can Im- impact a small business trying to pay employees but um, the reality is it's not enough you all do some sort of drug and alcohol uh, you have a policy for people so for basically um we don't drug test. Mm-hmm. We have the ability to do UAs if we feel like there's someone living at the shelter who's abusing alcohol or drugs on the premises. Um, even though marijuana is legal, we can't have our families um, continuing to use marijuana while they're living with us because it will impact their ability to become employed. 
and you have to really get employed to get back on your feet. So as long as employers are still testing, um, it's something we can't allow. Now, if you come into the shelter and you have you self-reveal to us that you're using marijuana or if we happen to see it or smell it, we will do a UA and just tell you, you know, we're going to do another random one in a couple of weeks, and if it's still in your system, then we might have to ask you to leave. Mm. And again, it's because we're always full. We have a waiting list. Absolutely have to use this program and give these resources to people who are going to be successful. And, you know, if you have a drug addiction and you need help with that, we can refer you to the right programs. And maybe you need to take care of that first before you start to work on everything else. Um, But it's not just marijuana. We've seen plenty of alcohol abuse at our shelter, and it's treated the same way. Mm. And, of course, the heavier drugs, if someone is heavily under the influence of, like, meth or anything like that we can't have them in the facility simply because they're not safe to the other families they can do damage to our building and so we have to screen for that but we're not again housing first is kind of a it's this low barrier philosophy so it's like we're going to try to help everybody Mm -hmm. um, and let us help you until you show us that you can't be helped and then we have to let you go you, you mentioned earlier that the 2008 recession affected mm-hmm. housing and families mm-hmm. in this community. And I'm going to sound like an ignorant, spoiled brat, but in 2008, when the recession happened, I was a freshman going to a local community college mm-hmm. outside Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And back then, I just kind of thought, oh, it's just people in the stock market who got affected. So really wealthy people who traded stocks and bonds all day are the only people that got affected. Why is it such a big deal? I knew better eventually. But I've been reminded of that impact since starting this podcast because so many guests and their stories of getting their business either here or a previous story that brought them to the organization that they're at now. The 2008 recession has come up multiple times within the first 30 episodes. Right. And I think it's just, it's a reminder that news stories don't just stop when people stop covering them in the newspapers that these effects of something like the housing bubble bursting in 2008 are still following us today right and they still follow individual families today and we don't always think about it or or know about that yeah and i've been thinking a little bit lately too about how it's been 10 years now it's like wow i remember back in 2008 really being worried for our organization because We rely a lot on private foundations who they make their wealth by investing in the stock market. So were we going to see all of our grant funding dry up and, you know, just even would federal programs be affected? And so I was pretty worried at the time that it was really going to affect our funding. But amazingly, we got through that. People were still generous in giving to charitable giving. The foundations really stepped up. They might not have done as much as they had in the past, but they they really tried to be conscious of the need to continue to help support all of this work. So I still, to this day, I'll run across families that are um, saying, you know, I, I lost my home during the recession, and it took me, you know, three or four years before I could actually do something different and get back on my feet and even rent an apartment. So, you know, once you lose your housing, that's something really important you were mentioning earlier, how easy it is to become homeless once you lose your housing it can be really hard to stabilize and get back to where you were before so that's one of the things we emphasize even for people who are living at a very low income try to maintain your housing no matter what there's resources out there for everything else but once you lose your housing it makes you unstable for a very long time and even if you get back into another apartment you know the you know maybe you had an eviction that will haunt you for a while or it screws up your credit or whatever. So, you know, I'm, I might be kind of talking up a rabbit trail here, but I, I do worry a lot about people who who feel like, oh, I can recover quickly. You really can't, unless you win the lottery or something. You can't recover quickly. Once a person becomes homeless, they a lot of times feel like, oh, it's going to be all right. I'm just going to bounce back from this. And it's yeah, I've seen that mentality quite a bit. It's just, oh, it's no big deal. I'm, I'm homeless. I'll get back on my feet soon. Well, then they start to look for housing, and they realize how expensive it is and how hard it is to find, let alone even having a choice where you're going to live. So when you're in this kind of a housing market and you're at a certain income level, you have to just 
take what you can get because there, it's not like there's a large stock of housing in this community. Uh, one thing um, I think is pretty revealing, I don't know if you've talked to anyone that's mentioned this, but I think it's still about at the same level, but about a year and a half ago, we had somewhere around 77 single residential houses on the market here in Greeley. Might not mean anything unless you put it into context that during the normal housing market, we had something like 700 residential houses on the market. So these are just your regular run of the mill single family houses. That's what, when you go to buy a house, that's what everybody looks at. There were only 77. And they're supposed to be about 700. And they're supposed to be like 700. Obviously, the families I work with aren't trying to buy a house. But what that tells you is that just spreads across the entire housing spectrum. So if there's not enough single-family residences to purchase, then that means those people that need and want to purchase have to rent. They're probably going to be able to rent. um, They will most likely be renting at a higher level but if there's not enough of that housing then it starts to move down and then it really starts to affect our population because they they can't afford a variety of types of housing options so it's kind of that trickle effect or ripple effect that once there's a problem on one end of the housing spectrum it pretty much impacts everything the other thing I've heard, too, is that we don't have enough of those very high-end housing options either. So that impacts mm. the – yeah, it's like, well, Surprised. sad. Oh, wow. <laughs> but where that impacts our community is you need to have a good stock of that housing if you want to attract employers that pay decent wages because you want the employees to live in this community. You know, some big high-tech company that pays well, you know, we might have a great deal for a a location for their manufacturing facility, but if all of their workers are forced to work or live in Larimer County or Boulder County because they can't find nice housing in Greeley, you know, we lose all those wages that are being spent in another community. Um, It's all interrelated, so... It's not just a poor people's problem is what I'm trying to say. It's yeah. it's all of our problem that our housing market is like this. Right. It's a, it's an everyone's problem. But when you have less chips to play with, mm-hmm. then you feel more constrained. Right. Whereas if I was walking into Greeley, I got 70 options and I got 500K to spend, I'm mm-hmm. going to get to go house shopping. Right. But if I walk into the Greeley area, 70 houses available, and I got 150,000, I'm not going to be looking at all 70. And I know. I, and I don't know if it's going to be more than 10. So. I've definitely, my son was in that same position, and I was just sad and shocked at what housing options were available for him. He, yeah. I feel like income is something that we all think about, mm-hmm. but we don't talk about it's like this hushed thing we put under the rug Mm -hmm. and i've been fascinated with this since i was a kid i will flippantly just tell people what i make Mm -hmm. like right off the cuff when we're talking about something and i've noticed people's reactions people are surprised by that or they they they'll go to say what they make and they they'll pull back and i just think it's so interesting in a society where everybody makes money and we all yeah. internally crave to make more and we we look at our bank statements normally yeah but we won't discuss it with another and i think it's an interesting part of human it society it is i've thought of that myself and like my kids don't know what i make i don't really know what they make i never knew what my parents made it's almost like religion. You're afraid to talk about your religion because you're not really sure what the other person's thinking. And I don't know if we feel like we're going to be judged one way or the other. If I tell you what I make and you think that's way too much or you tell me and I think that's way too much or whatever. So there's, maybe it's there's too much judgment around money. Like your value is tied to how much money yeah. you make. Well, it's fascinating because I might get judged for making too little. I don't know. And then if... if people are judging you because you make too much well that's what you yeah. want that's, right. you didn't you didn't take the promotion and say oh i'm sorry boss but i'd like fifteen thousand dollars less than right. what you because you just paid me too much no right. one's saying that right and yet we're not wanting to communicate this with other people and there's all the judgment and value statements around you know people think people in poverty are are poor because they are lazy or they don't want to work or they're not mentally smart enough to to make more money and then conversely we tend to judge people who have a lot of money particularly those who inherited their wealth mm. you know that they don't deserve it you know they you know why should they get more than the rest and 
So it's like this yeah. sweet spot where we think you got to work hard for it. Yeah. And, and you have to be able to achieve it in the right way possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a sweet spot. <laughs> the first time you meet a teacher who has a master's degree, two kids, and is below the poverty line because of what she gets paid, mm-hmm. igniting the flame for high school students, but she has two k- kids of her own, right. that will quickly redefine what you think of the poverty line. Exactly. And I had that experience in my very first job out yeah. of school. Yeah. Before we get too far back yeah. away from the 2008 recession, I never really understood it. And I just want to give this plug out there for listeners. There's a movie out there called The Big Short. Oh, yes. I've seen it. And when it first came out, I saw it at the Cress. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was going to be good. Mm-hmm. But I walked away a gasp. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what to do with myself. Mm-hmm. It has Steve Carell, Brad Pitt, Ryan Gosling, mm-hmm. Christian Bale, star-studded cast, amazingly written. And that movie followed me home because I real I understood it and I realized how dirty it all was. Yeah, it's corruption. That's yeah. all it is. And greed. Yeah. And it affected and impacted the entire world, really. And people didn't think it would. I mean, some did, but yeah. a lot of them didn't even know what was mm-hmm. what the possible ramifications were. Yeah. I want to plug that movie, The yeah. Big Short. Yep. It's an excellent film. Earlier you mentioned a waiting list, and a thought that came across my mind was, what do families do while they're on the waiting list? So what we do with that waiting list is we really get more detail what's going on. If you're in your car or if you're in a motel or other place that's unfit for human habitation, you rise to the top of that waiting list. So we try to get you in as quickly as we can, particularly if you're in a car. Next priority really is a motel because that's not a sustainable thing for people in poverty. So most of the other people that are on our waiting list are usually just treading water, trying to get out of their relative's home or a friend's home, get back on their feet, and they just really can't do it without some help. The nice thing, too, about going to an emergency shelter, even though there's stigma around this, I always tell people this is the best decision you could have made because now you're plugged into resources. You have someone who can navigate all of the resources that are out there and get you what you need to really stabilize. It also prioritizes people who are homeless or at a higher priority level on those waiting lists for other housing I told you about, the subsidized housing. If you're homeless, you're automatically moved up on that list. So if I stay in my cousin's home and don't really let anybody know I'm homeless and just keep struggling. I really can't ever break out of that. I never get put on a priority list for housing. I never get some of those additional resources that I didn't even know existed um, that can help me. So it really is no one should ever be ashamed of becoming homeless or needing services from a shelter. To me, it's it's a really great first step. Do you feel like there's friendships or camaraderie that come out of the families that mm-hmm are staying together at the same time at the transitional house. Oh, yeah, we've seen that quite a bit. Kids it, playing together. Oh, and, yeah, definitely. And Because a young boy on one of the videos on the website mentioned that he liked the transitional house because he mm-hmm. made a lot of friends there. Yeah, right. So at any one time, there can be as many as 25 kids living there. So, yeah, they definitely do interact with each other and develop friendships. I, I see a lot of the adults helping each other out. You know, they'll, we do not allow child care in the facility so you can't dump all your kids with another family and just go off and do your own thing Mm. Um, we want every family to be working on their own individual situation but ride sharing is a big thing that happens so probably only about 70 percent of the families that come to us have a car so they're all the rest are relying on rides or the bus system or walking or whatever so they'll help each other out with rides sometimes they'll take their kids to school for them we've seen people share uh, meals we don't encourage food sharing but you know if you want to combine meals and kind of work together the one thing that happens occasionally if we get a single male there sometimes the 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 women will try to mother them and cook for them and things so (laughs) we try to (laughs) <laughs> discourage that because again you really need to focus on your own situation you shouldn't be giving your food away or whatever but definitely what i do sense from every single family that's there is is empathy for each other you know they just realize they're all in this together they'll tell each other about jobs they've heard about other resources kind of those word of mouth on the street resources that we don't all know about you know my my cousin can 
he really knows how to fix Fords and he'll fix your car for you and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of that basic helping of each other too. To your knowledge, have you had a family come to the transitional house? They left you all, they got back on their feet, and they were making it well enough that they turned around and donated to the transitional house. We've had a lot of people promise to do that. <clears throat> We've only had one or two do actually do that. You know, it's, it's something they want to do. They want to give back. The most profound example I can give you, though, is there's a couple that started out as shelter residents and just loved us so much that they wanted to come back and volunteer. So they came back and did a few things for us. Um, you know, they'd help us organize donations and things like that. So not too long down the road, I had a, a, a house manager position. These are the people that are there in the evenings and overnight. So I offered it to the, the male, the dad. And then um, not too much longer, six months later, I had another position, offered it to the wife. Long story short, they're now our resident manager at those apartments. And they're both employees, and they've been there for like nine or ten years. So they're like a really profound example. But we've had other people give small donations, come back and volunteer, come back and offer to cut other cut hair, you know, like give haircuts for the the kids and mm. things like that. So come back and interact, yeah, in non financial ways, but yeah. still supporting the community. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that, that definitely happens. Right. And how did you? stumble upon or come into the graces of the transitional house. <laughs> yeah. So actually, um, I knew about the transitional house way back in the early 90s when it was first starting out. I was just always really impressed with its mission. You know, just how can you not love the thought of helping homeless families? At the time, I was working at a quasi-governmental program that provided financial assistance to small businesses. So I kind of picked up those skills and I served on the board of a couple of small nonprofits and just realized that I really did like um, nonprofit work and wanted to pursue it as a career. I got the opportunity to go to school at Regis University in Denver. I was able to get a fellowship to do that through the Colorado Trust. Mm. So I went back to school and got my master's degree in nonprofit management. I served as the development director at uh, Salude Family Health Centers, which is exactly like Sunrise, only it serves other parts of northern Colorado. Was there for a few years, and I saw this executive director position come up. And since I'd always really loved this little nonprofit, it was just the perfect opportunity for me. And now you've been there since 2005. Yeah, 13 years. And before working, you were a UNC Bear. Oh, uh, yeah, right. That was a really long time ago, yeah. but it was, yeah, loved UNC. So yeah. we are sitting here in McKee Hall, which you said you started in. Right. So start. if you regale people with your story of your, your yeah. undergrad experience. Right. So I came to Greeley. I grew up in Pueblo, but I came to Greeley to t attend UNC. And I, my goal was to be an education major, obviously, UNC is very well known for its ed education program, but I think a really smart thing they do in the education program is they have you serve as a, a classroom aide pretty early on in your your coursework. And I just realized pretty quickly that I just wasn't really cut out for teaching. So You're I like, switched. My God, one or two kids, but thirty? Oh well, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't want to disparage the teaching profession but no, I was quite absolutely not. yes so right. anyway I switched to business and I ended up getting a degree in journalism at the end so and I just stepped foot in the Montfort School of Business yeah two days ago for the first time really yeah really oh it's a great school great building lots of great programs I've been over there quite a bit what uh, brought you to UNC from Pueblo um really just again the reputation of the School of Education Oh, right. It's, even back then, this was a long time ago, even back then it was really well known as a great teaching college. So, so you've never really left northern Colorado no, once no. you got a taste of it. I'm kind of rare that way. There's Either you were raised here, lived here all your life, or you've just come in in the last you know 10 or 20 years. I've been here for more than 40 years now, which is really crazy to think about. But right. I raised a family here, and it's it was a great place for to raise a family and I gotta think by 2018 native Coloradans it's gotta be such a trip when you finally hear someone else who's a native and yeah. you, you have this like non-verbal bonding moment because yeah. not very yeah. many people are yeah 
I mean, especially, I can't share in that because right. obviously you're from out of state, but yeah. even, especially when you start to be get to be my age too, just to find people that are natives is is harder. But I love Colorado, and so does everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> yep. That's that's why it, that's why we're here. Yep. I imagine the Greeley Transitional House, your mission, your objectives stay the same, but is there anything on the horizon or anything in the future that you're looking forward to, or do you, you know, do you all have any goals or, or things? All right, you so you and I have mission? not had this conversation yet. I am actually retiring from GTH as of November 30th. Wow. Um, well, and this, it been- it, but yeah, it's been, this has been in play for a few several months, but I've been there 13 years, and I just... Uh, felt that it was time for me to pass the baton to the next director and let someone bring new innovation and new energy and new passion. I've obviously not lost any of my passion for it, but I think what I've heard over the years is that the typical length of time that an ED serves in a nonprofit organization is around seven years. So I've obviously extended that quite a bit. And, you know, I think it just... These types of organizations are really difficult to really keep really fresh and really in front of everyone. So if the community, you know, starts to just associate all the work that we do with me and I've been around forever, you just have kind of this natural tendency to just assume that everything's fine, it's status quo, There, you know, Jody's there, they'll always be fine. It's full of families. Yeah, everything's fine, but we've got this whole new cause out there right now that, you know, it's really on everyone's mind and let's put a lot of funding towards it. So I, I think it, you put your organization at risk if you lull the community into just feeling like, it's just an, not that the work we do is not important and it's not respected. Uh, it just doesn't feel as urgent when you have someone really capable doing it for a really long time. It just doesn't, I don't know, it becomes almost like a governmental bureaucracy or whatever. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I just know, I instinctively know that when they bring fresh new leadership, fresh energy, a fresh voice, it will put us back on the map a little bit and The community will start to take notice again, and the work we do, um, this new person will be able to just bring a whole new, fresh voice to it. And I think that will be really good for the organization. Congratulations on retirement. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad we got to catch you here at the end. I had no idea. Yeah, I know. And I didn't mean to surprise you with that, but just never came up as, you know, a relevant thing to tell you. Great surprise. Yeah. You are stepping into retirement out of the Greeley Transitional House. You turn around 13 years of work. Yeah. What are you taking away from it? Oh, just how rewarding it is to help a family that you are seeing just really struggle and really feel like they are, that no one's listening, no one's paying attention to what's happening, that they're kind of invisible, and that once we get them into our programs and we start working with them, they start to become more visible again, and they feel heard, and they feel hope, and they feel inspired to keep going. And I love that work. Just in the last two or three weeks we brought in a couple of families and I was able to personally interact with them and see that happen and I thought oh what am I doing why am I leaving this I really love this I really love helping people and not just a handout but just really helping them figure out how to do this on their own and give them that support and of course I love my staff I have a really great staff great board of directors that where you met Leslie community partners you know I there's so many people in the community doing such great work I've gotten to know. So I'm going to miss all of that, but I don't really think I'm totally going away. I'm not I'm not riding off into the sunset kind of retiring. <laughs> it's not like the end of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> no. Where Frodo gets on the ship. And... I love that. Yeah. No, not quite. But I'll, I'll probably be involved on some level in the nonprofit community. So, yeah. But I want to give this new director just lots of space and the opportunity to make this organization her own and pretty excited for the next stage for the Greenlee Transitional House. Well, if people have been inspired or they're curious or for any reason they want to reach out on the website, that website would be... It's pretty easy. It's www.greeleetransitionalhouse, all one word, dot org. 
Okay. And people can find a way to donate there if they want. Yep. They can look into how they can help. There's even like uh, donations for yeah. like physical items and stuff. Yeah. So we do a lot of in-kind donations. People yeah. like to help. Household items, sheets, towels, dishes, all those kinds of things that a family might need to get back on their feet. So we do accept a lot of that. Mm. And with the holiday season fast yep. approaching, I hope some people take a peruse at the website after listening to this episode. Great. Thank you. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I've loved it. Thank and, you. And congratulations. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> As always, I want to shout out Russell Isaac Long for all the wonderful music used here at the Morinoco. Are you looking for a little bit of bonus content in addition to the regular episodes on the show? Look for us out there on the interwebs on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at The More You Know Co. Until next time, peace! <laughs>